Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Dick and I are delighted to be interviewing Carrie Shankman. Carrie, along with Ralph Engelman, uh, are the authors of A Century of Repression, The Espionage Act and Freedom of the Press. And Carrie is going to talk to us today about this awesome book that Dick and I um, have read and I being um, a person who went to law school and was a law professor for seven years teaching contracts law was just fascinated by some of the information that Carrie, you and Ralph um, uncovered and shared with your readers. Dick, why don't you go ahead and, and, and start? Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us, Carrie. As someone who who drove someone to law school and brought her home each night for for four years, uh, I much admired the book. So, so when most people think of the Espionage Act, they imagine foreign spies uh, uh, stealing secrets from an American defense plant or or bribing a, a soldier to reveal military secrets. But your your book makes it clear that that's not really how the espionage has been used over the decades. Could you talk about how it's how it's actually been deployed? Absolutely. And thank you so much, Dick and Sharon, for having me. I've followed the LA Progressive for a long time in both of your individual work. And I, I'm so grateful <laughs> for the contributions that you make and for also the, the honor of being on this program. In terms of the book and the Espionage Act, we chose a subtitle, The Espionage Act and Freedom of the Press. Because even though this law is called the Espionage Act, as you point out, that would call to mind, tend to call to mind, traditional spies, as you or I would understand that word in conversation. So it means that somebody who is paid or in the employ of a foreign power to try to take secrets for the advantage uh, of that power. But when we look at the over 100-year-old history of this law, I want to stress that this law is um, over a hundred years old. That's why we call it a century of repression. If you look at the whole history, this law was not just about prosecuting spies. In fact, it has a very rich and, and many times sad political history. It was passed during one of the most politically repressive periods in American history during World War I, right at the entry of the U.S. into that war. In fact, President Woodrow Wilson, when he gave his speech, finally changing the U.S. position. So, so the U.S. Was, for a long time was isolationist, was against being involved in what it saw as a European war. But Woodrow Wilson changed tune. And when he gave this big speech declaring U.S. entry into the war, he said that any dissent, any sedition needed to be met with, quote, a firm hand of stern repression. And that speech was the call for the passage of the Espionage Act. So just within two months of U.S. entry into the war, the Espionage Act was passed. And in fact, it punished a lot of conduct that went well beyond spying. I think one of the most illustrative passages was the following. Quote, whoever, when the United States is at war, shall willfully make or convey false reports or false statements with intent to interfere with the operation or success of the military or naval forces of the United States, or to promote the success of its enemies and whoever shall willfully cause or attempt to cause insubordination, disloyalty, mutiny or refusal of duty in the military or naval forces of the United States shall be punished by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than 20 years or both. So when you hear that, you don't hear being employed by a foreign power and stealing secrets. You hear insubordination, disloyalty, <laughs> causing refusal of duty. And in fact, among the first 2000 prosecutions of the Espionage Act, the targets were not spies. They were members of the Socialist Party, which was one of the most vibrant political forces of the period and at its height historically. There are the labor unions, such as the industrial workers of the world, which was a very vibrant and powerful force at the time. And we witnessed mass trials of folks who were accused of being opposed to the U.S. war effort. 
So, you know, thank you for that information. Um, in reading your book, it seems to me that people who did something as benign as the filmmaker early on in the book, I don't know if this was in the introduction, but early on in the book, you talk about Robert Goldstein, who was making a film about the Revolutionary War. And he um, painted the, um, the uh, England in, in, in a bad light. He put England in a bad light because obviously we were talking about the Revolutionary War, but at the time of World War I, they were one of our allies. And Absolutely. he was, <laughs> so you talk about Robert Goldstein. Oh yeah, that there, in do, doing the research for this book, we uncovered so many bizarre cases. I mean, I, 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 I wish I could have made some of this up, but there, there are so many characters in, in this cast of this history of this book, not just with the targets of these cases, but between the prosecutors, the, the administrations, the political forces involved. And, and, and really, we, we try to tell a story uh, of people. So, I mean, when you, when you hear that this book is about this law, the Espionage Act, it can, it, it can maybe sound a little bit scary that it's aimed toward a narrow readership, but we really try to tell the stories of people because these laws, even though they exist in the clouds, they can have a real human impact. So with Robert Goldstein, that's one of these really strange stories. So he was this hapless filmmaker. He sunk close to 200,000 of his own money into the film. Keep in mind, a uh, hundred years ago, that that was quite a bit of money. And it, it told the story that that painted, it was about the Revolutionary War and it painted, uh, I believe that it was the queen of, um, uh, it, it was the monarchy of England that talked about King George's mistress as queen of America and de depicted British atrocities that were largely, <laughs> largely true if we know anything about British imperial history. And so Goldstein was charged under the new newly minted Espionage Act. It opened in May 1917, just a few weeks after U.S. entry into the war. And he... Uh, he was going against, at the time, uh, effort by Hollywood. So we see this throughout history, uh, actually, where uh, as part of U.S. information campaigns, Hollywood has often been enlisted uh, as part of those efforts. And we, we go back. I mean, that that was one thing that, that drew Ronald Reagan to the presidency as a former actor, a former actor. And there have been books written, written about that. But... Hollywood had been enlisted in, in that war effort. He was eventually released after being uh, charged uh, and convicted under the Espionage Act just after three years, but he just faded into the shadows. In researching the book, we actually tried to find a copy of Spirit of 76, which was the name of his film, but it seems that no copy actually survived him, sadly, because I, I would have loved to have seen it, but all we can read about are, are in books. Uh, he was last heard from, I believe, in 1935 in uh, in Germany, and and very sadly uh, is presumed to have perished in a in a concentration camp. Yeah. <laughs> so, so chapter four of your book is titled Amir Asia. Around 1945, it looked like the Espionage Act began to take on a new meaning. Can you talk a little bit about the Amir Asia affair and how that played out in subsequent history? Absolutely. So the first part of our book looks at the two world wars where the Espionage Act was used primarily as a tool for political repression. So to go after dissidents, to go after the anti-war movement, it was instrumental in the rise of the ACLU as well. So those uh, conscientious objector cases during World War One, those were a bulk actually of the, uh, the predecessor to the um, uh, to the ACLU and its founder, um, Roger Baldwin, had led those cases. So we, we saw that trend during the World Wars. But then there's a shift in 1945, which you raise to the Espionage Act as a direct tool for information control. And that's when we really start to see this law be used to prosecute whistleblowers and insider sources who are providing information to the press that either shows the government in a bad light, is contrary to the policy of whatever administration is in power, or what we see nowadays, the revelation of war crimes and serious 
abuses, whether uh, unconstitutional actions or, or human rights violations. So the Amerasia case was, again, this very bizarre uh, story. There's a lot of contention his historically. There, there's some folks today who insist that it was a, a, a communist plot within the State Department. But the Amerasia case, uh, <laughs> we won't go into all, all the details of it, but basically it, it centered on a, a, a high-level foreign affairs journal that was considered an expert in East Asia issues. And at the time after World War II, there was a big debate within the State Department and the U.S. administration, what do we do about China? Because China was going through a civil war and there was the uh, communists that were led by Mao and there were the nationalists that were led by a Chiang Kai-shek. So we know historically what how that civil, civil war ended, Mao won, and uh, China turned into a communist country. What the U.S. was, the U.S. was backing the nationalists, and you had State Department employees who are very smart on the ground. They've been raised in China, and they were, they were begging their superiors, saying, hey, we need to be real here. We need to establish some line of communication, something with Mao. They're going to take over, and we're going to be completely frozen out if we're still backing the nationalists, because the nationalists were corrupt, they were losing, and historically they, they ended up being forced out um, to Taiwan. Their superiors were not listening to them, and those diplomats on the ground took to the press. And one of the, uh, one of the outlets that they spoke to and provided information to was this small journal, Amerasia. So what happened in that case is McCarthy, Senator uh, Senator McCarthy was just starting out with his, his career. And that case became a lightning rod for him. And in fact, some of these diplomats who were implicated in, the, in this whole case surrounding China were McCarthy's first targets. He named them by name in his Wheeling, uh, West Virginia speech. So we we make the argument, which is which has been made by other historians, that this Amerasia case really kicked off McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Now, this was an Espionage Act case. They had accused those employees of providing uh, providing unauthorized uh, classified information to the press and protested how much harm. All, all, all these documents did. In, in, in reality, the majority of the documents were benign. They were talking about things how Chiang Kai-shek's uh, mistress had thrown a, you know, thrown a vase out the window, um, you know, onto onto his wife, and and just th things like uh, gossip. On honestly, diplomatic gossip. We actually see some parallels to. Um, to today, so when we saw the Cablegate releases of um, uh, of WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange, uh, there was a lot of talk about how much harm those releases did, and a lot and a lot of what was revealed was uh, was simply day to day diplomatic talk and, and and gossip. But that that case is significant because I I think it really embodies this demonizing of targets in Espionage Act cases as spies. Because the same dialogues were happening then. The defendants in, in the Amerasia case were accused of being spies. The New York Times story about their arrest talked about the charging of a spy room. And the mainstream press was, was not helpful, even though this was a freedom of the press case with huge freedom of the press implications. So, wow. so one, one implication of that was, I think, in your book is that uh, these China hands were forced out, persecuted out, and replaced by others who who uh, had a, a more traditional view on China. And as a consequence, that I believe you make the point that that may have led to mistakes that uh, uh, helped us stumble into Vietnam. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm really glad you brought that up, because the sad consequence of a lot of these Espionage Act prosecutions, which from that point had been used to go after insider sources who saw huge missteps, waste, fraud, and abuse within the government and weren't being listened to. And oftentimes we'll, we'll hear today, well, why don't folks go through official channels? Uh, you hear that 
you hear that so-called rebuttal with Edward Snowden all the time. Why, why didn't he face the music and go through official channels? You'll hear, hear Daniel Ellsberg, who is a source of the Pentagon Papers. You'll hear Thomas Drake, who Edward Snowden uh, considered his direct inspiration. Um, and so many former officials who've spoken to the press say these official channels are, are non-existent. They are corrupt. They will simply out you and they don't lead to any meaningful change. So that, that's not a meaningful option. In, in terms of the sad price that gets paid by these cases, as you point out, they lead to ostracizing and forcing out brilliant, brilliant government servants. I mean, you look at the you look at the work of folks like Daniel Ellsberg. You look at uh, you look at these folks. I mean, they're they're not these fringe nobodies. I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. Who are published, who are respected in their fields, who are who are sought as policymakers and and thinkers at the highest levels. They get forced out, and I think that does also a very uh, real disservice that le leads to these huge blunders, such as the Vietnam War. I think numerous historians have argued that the policy and the uh, forcing out of the China hand set in, uh, set in a succession, a series of events that led to the Korean War, that led to Vietnam, because we had really lost uh, key experts uh, on the region. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, this book is such an interesting read. And I mentioned that you are a law professor, and um, I don't want our listeners to think that this book is just steeped in legal lingo. Um, the both of the authors do a wonderful job of telling of, of making the 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 people in the book of humanizing them, including humanizing J. Edgar Hoover and Roger Baldwin. And I liked very much the way that you compared and contrasted the two of them. I mean, even going back to how they were raised, Hoover coming from um, lower middle class beginnings and and Roger Baldwin. Um, coming from um, wealth and and how that shaped or informed them as they took on these somewhat parallel paths, parallel and opposite paths. So can you talk a little bit about J. Edgar Hoover's beginnings and Roger Baldwin's beginnings and how these two men, um, one being an essential player in the founding of the ACLU and the other one being um, an essential player in the FBI, how they touched the Espionage Act, how they interacted with it. Absolutely. So I'm I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I think that's one of the main threads in, in this book that we were really happy to frame. And Ra Ralph, I, I don't want to take the credit for it. Ralph Engelman, my my co-author, was really the driving force of that. And that afterwards, I plan to tell him because I think he'll be thrilled at how much you you pointed that out and, and drew from that. But we really tried to not only tell the story of the Espionage Act, but really the growth of two sides of a coin. The A, the modern civil liberties movement, and B, the rise of, of the FBI and ultimately the national security state. And as you point out, these, these two threads were outgrowths of the First World War. So Roger Baldwin, the future founder of the ACLU, he had started his career actually with the, um, with the uh, American Union against militarism which was a, a predecessor for uh, the ACLU. And it provided le uh, legal aid for conscientious objectors. And we saw a shift actually in uh, Roger Baldwin's outlook that I think mirrors uh, the shift within the civil liberties movement. And that it really started out extremely radical. It was tied deeply to movements. It was tied deeply to labor. And as we saw the ACLU and we saw the modern civil liberties begin to take hold and then all these First Amendment cases come out of the First World War, that, that movement attempted to become more mainstream and get more appeal, more funding, and as such drifted away from radicalism, drifted away from espousing the ideals of those it represented. And this really came to a head during the time of McCarthy, which was really a dark period of the ACLU, where it ousted Elizabeth Gurley Flynn um, off of its board. Um, 
uh, due to communism and really was not uh, a, a not a defender of accused communists dur during the war. Now, there's been a, a circle where the ACLU has has come to defend Espionage Act cases again. And you look like um, some of the key attorneys like at, at the ACLU, like Ben Wisner, defend Edward Snowden and are, are quite vocal and also in um, opposing the extradition and the charging uh, of Julian Assange under the Espionage Act. So, so there's really been this uh, circle as we trace, but it, it, it's an issue actually that the ACLU struggles with today. I think there is a big Times article maybe a year ago about how there's been fractures within the ACLU about things like their defense of Citizens United, which a lot of folks don't realize Citizens United was defended by the ACLU. That was a case that defended uh, corporations' First Amendment rights that has, in effect, led to unlimited uh, political and election influence by corporations. But as a matter of strict First Amendment principle, uh, many will argue that that was correctly decided, even though it has horrible practical implications. Same for the defense of white supremacists um, like Charlottesville, uh, etc. Et a lot of these uh, right, far extreme right wing hate speech uh, cases are defended um, by either um, uh, oftentimes by the ACLU or, or similarly um, minded organizations that are doing it for protecting the rights. And there's a lot of debate within the ACLU, where do you draw the line of the types of defendants you take on? So we really try to explore some of those, those themes. We go into it in depth, but Roger Baldwin, he's a fascinating character, as you point out, he comes from an upper class background. In contrast to J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, in many respects, um, had uh had several chips on, on his shoulder uh he's a kind of bull you know we point out that he uh you know he's uh faced bullying and he was recruited actually as a young man by john uh john lord o'brien um who uh was the head of the uh, war emergency division during world war one and really from the beginning of his career j edgar hoover was instrumental in going after political dissent that, that was his job to, to go after the anti-war movement. And we argue that the climate of World War I and these Espionage Act prosecutions really shaped uh, J. Edgar Hoover's worldview and his, not only his distrust of dissidents in the anti-war movement, but uh, really his racism as well. Um, because we saw uh, J. Edgar Hoover's racism at full play during World War One and World War II when he specifically uh, targeted uh, Black publications uh, that were pro-civil liberties, and he saw it as a result being a, a threat to uh, U.S. efforts uh, abroad. And there was a, a big movement, actually, during uh, World War II where J. Edgar Hoover uh, was putting a lot of pressure on the Justice Department and on FDR to actually prosecute Black publications under the Espionage Act. Then we saw actually a, a very strong coalition uh, led by uh, a young man, John Sensak, that, um, uh, with a Chicago defender who actually headed a number of publications and pushed back against that and was successful actually in getting FDR to back them. But there were there were serious uh, investigations and prosecutions uh, by, by Hoover. And this is something that I, I think gets often ignored uh, historically is the vibrancy of the black press over the two world wars and the, and the existential threats that they faced. Um, you know, the very real investigations uh, that, that were led by Hoover. And then we look forward, fast forward decades, we look at COINTELPRO, we look at the investigations of the Black Panthers, and we argue you can you can draw a line back to World War I when, when this stuff was getting shaped and, and it was business as usual for J. Edgar Hoover. So I, I know that's a, a little bit of a, a long response um, to your question, but it, it's really an important topic. And these two are... are uh, important threads we feel in really understanding what's happening in 20th century U.S. history politically. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit overwhelming, and I, I have to say a little bit depressing, especially yeah. being a, a black person uh, who is a member of the ACLU. And I, Matt Dick, and I are actually on the board of the ACLU, and oh. we're very familiar with some of the internal struggles as well as some of the wonderful victories of the ACLU. Yeah. 
I thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, go ahead, Dick. Yeah, yeah. Could you talk a bit about your discovery of a discussion of the movie War Games in some of the documentation you uncovered <laughs> in researching the book? We thought that was an interesting story. Absolutely. So this is another one of these absolutely, I, I just want to say it's a bonkers discovery about, about some of these influential and scary aspects of U.S. policy, but uh, it, it's, I'm not making it up when I say that War Games, the 1980s Matthew Broderick blockbuster, was the catalyst for our current computer crime law and policy, like full, full stop. It, it is. So what, what happened is Reagan was watching war games at Camp David. He got really freaked out when he saw this movie depiction of a teenage hacker uh, hacking into uh, military uh, nuclear computers and sparking a world war. So he took it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and and at a meeting, just kind of looked back and forth and, and said, wait, is is this possible? Can a can a teenager do this? And the others kind of I kind of shrugged, but but said that this might theoretically be possible. And and that that was a push, literally the push for passage of the law called the Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act, which to this day is the computer crimes law used to uh, go after a number of. Uh, computer related crimes. There's a lot of controversy actually around this law because it's so antiquated. It predated the modern inter internet and most of, uh, if not all the devices we're using on a daily basis. In fact, the Supreme Court had a big case just, um, just about a year ago reviewing key aspects of, of that law because there's been a lot of disagreements within the courts about interpreting it. But when I, when I say this, this, Hollywood film was behind passage of this law, I mean that in researching the congressional reports of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and we cite it in the book, there are references to war games. Like they're cited in the congressional record. I wish I was making that up, th this up. And it, it really just goes to remind us of the, the implications of uninformed policy and how scary that is because there are people in prison because of the CFAA. I don't know if uh, if listeners and viewers know of the case of Aaron Schwartz, which is a, a horribly tragic and heartbreaking case. So Aaron Schwartz was a brilliant young visionary and programmer, one of the co-founders of Reddit, um, had worked deeply in activist and uh, in privacy spaces, but he uh, pushed for an effort to try to make academic articles uh, public and accessible. So I don't know if folks are familiar with JSTOR and other databases like that, but a lot of a lot of uh, so much scholarship is paywalled. <laughs> and if you're a member of the public and don't have institutional access, you're basically frozen out from a, a lot of knowledge. So he had gone to the M MIT campuses and uh, downloaded uh, troves of articles and tried to make uh, make them public. So MIT and JSTOR actually declined to push for charges for him. They thought, hey, you know, this this is just someone who's trying to act in the public interest. Don't don't do it again. But you know, this this isn't some black hat hacker going into into banks and trying to steal credit cards. Uh, the DOJ took a different different tune, and there are actually prosecutors who who really regretted it after. Because they, at the time, Anonymous was big. There were a lot of scares about hackers, and the DOJ wanted to nail someone to the cross. So they picked Aaron Schwartz. And for that, they actually they uh, charged him, and he was facing upwards of 30 or more years under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I'm not, I'm not making that up for just making uh, scholarly articles available to the public. At the time, uh, sadly, uh, Aaron um, was suffering from extreme depression. And um, he, out of principle, refused to take a plea deal. They, they said, hey, listen, we'll give you a, a slap on the wrist if you admit guilt. And he didn't want to do that. And he was he stuck to his guns. But uh, tragically, he, he committed suicide in his par uh, apartment before he faced trial. And in fact, some of the big efforts to reform that law are, are called Aaron's law um, for that. But 
Uh, so going back, I mean, we can we can talk about war games and we can talk about you know how how silly and and funny it is that that this uh, that that this uh, was the impetus, but we have to remind ourselves too that it also has real world implications and ruins lives, and that that's what's truly scary is when you have incompetence at that level that is causing that degree of damage to people. Yeah, yeah that 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 really is scary, and and you bring up um, a nice segue into our next uh, set of questions, which which have to do with Julian Assange um, and the Espionage Act. And um, you have you talked about, I listened to a, a, a videotape of you talking about the elements um, of the Espionage Act and how there is no inclusion for a, a public interest defense. So um, saying all of those things, why don't you Give us a little bit of background of the Julian Assange case and your role in that and um, where Julian Assange, the status of that case right now. Absolutely. So we're talking a lot about the historical Espionage Act cases, but one of the reasons that we published this book was because the Espionage Act is the key law that's used to go after government whistleblowers today. It was a law that was used to prosecute Chelsea Manning. It was a law that Edward Snowden was charged under. It was a law that countless under, uh, others like Reality Winner, Thomas Drake, now Julian Assange have been charged under. And that law now is morphed into a, a tool for prosecuting whistleblowers. So that's why we thought it was really important to look at the political history of the Espionage Act going back so long. The Julian Assange case, now a lot of folks, when they hear Assange charged under the Espionage Act, think, oh, he's being charged with spying, he's being charged with allegations surrounding Russia in the 2016 elections. The case against Julian Assange has nothing to do with anything that, that happened after uh, 2013. In fact, the bulk of the conduct actually alleged is from 2010, uh, 2011, surrounding the publications of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Cablegate. Now, the, these were award-winning publications that permanently changed the, the face of journalism. I know a lot of folks uh, have polarized uh, opinions about uh, Julian Assange, um, there are folks that make the claim that he's not a journalist, which I, I frankly think um, is uh, is misfounded simply because nearly every journalistic outlet uh, is using the methodologies that Julian Assange invented. So to say that he's somehow not a journalist is is uh, is wild to me. Like literally, uh, the a big uh, source. Uh, anonymity and submission tool called Secure Drop was directly inspired um, by um, uh, by WikiLeaks and uh, put together by uh, many of its uh, supporters, including actually Aaron Schwartz was um, was one of those behind uh, Secure Drop and also a, a big um, advocate for transparency and, and supporter of uh, WikiLeaks, uh, but. Um, the uh, the case against Assange, so he was charged in 2019. Um, initially, then there is a, a superseding indictment, but he has 17 counts under the Espionage Act and one count under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the, the act, which I, I talked about, uh, that goes back to war games, he's also charged under that. And what the indictment alleges is that Julian Assange uh, published information that uh, about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and uh, as well as maintain a relationship with Chelsea Manning. Now, th the conduct alleged uh, of Assange is conduct engaged in by journalists every single day, by national security journalists. And uh, the publication of classified information is something that happens every day. On the New York Times and Washington Post, you open up those pages, you see government insiders leaking all the time. Donald Trump did it all the time, every day, would talk about classified information. But when they do it in their own uh, political interest, it, it, it's something where the DOJ looks the uh, other way. But where folks are exposing corruption, waste, fraud, or abuse, or human rights violations, that's that's when they get they get prosecuted. So it's, Assange was charged in 2019. It's a very contentious case. It's the first time 
someone like like him has been charged under this act. So these cases that I've talked about, like the Amerasia, Ellsberg, uh, we didn't go too much into them, but ones like the Chelsea Manning case, Snowden, those were all government employees. Those are people that decided, I'm going to take a job for the government. I'm going to agree to uh, agree to keep secrets and, and there might be some room to argue okay well you m maybe there should be some administrative uh review or so or maybe you know we shouldn't criminally prosecute you but there might be some arguments to say okay there there's some some obligation uh there because of that that relationship now i'd argue that a public interest defense would absolve criminal liability but there's at least if the government comes in and argues you worked for you know you, you had a job for the government you had this agreement uh, you can you can see there's something to that position but but assange is different he didn't work for the u.s government never had any agreement uh to 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 keep any secrets he's not even a u.s citizen i mean the last time he was in the u.s was well over a decade ago, and yet he's charged and, and faces over 100 years in prison if he's extradited here. So not surprisingly, a lot of folks take issue with that, because if Assange gets charged, how is any person on earth safe? Because he's literally saying someone who's not a government employee, not even a U.S. citizen, faces jurisdiction on, uh, under this act and somehow an obligation to keep information about U.S. war crimes and human rights violation secret. Really, the position of the DOJ in this case and the US government is that everyone on Earth, they get that kind of information, has a duty to keep it secret, which is that really a precedent that we want to set. So that that's why the stakes are so high in this case. It also has a incredible impact on, on Julian Assange as a person. He has a family, he has two young kids, he has a partner who has been a the most vocal and, and supportive uh, person uh, to him, uh, Stella Morris, and he has been holding up, but it has been a hard road. He was confined to the Ecuadorian embassy. He was in British detention. Now he's at Belmarsh Prison. He's had uh, he's dealt with health issues. He's dealt with isolation. He's dealt with surveillance. He's de dealt with death threats, everything under the sun. And I'm not making this up. Pompeo, um, uh, just in a recent book, took credit for trying to ruin the life of Assange and talking about going personally and, and uh, pressuring the Ecuadorian government to hand over Assange uh, to the British. Uh, there were a uh, bombshell stories and Yahoo about uncovered plots to assassinate him in the embassy. And, and these were well-sourced. I mean, they they weren't just tabloid stories. They're well-sourced. So it, it's really a terrible situation, both legally, but also personally. And right now that case is in the UK courts. It's uh, There's a decision to extradite Assange at the at the lower level, but that's currently being appealed by his legal team, and the U.S. government is uh, is opposing that. Uh, but there are a number of legal avenues ahead, and that's currently being uh, being briefed. So we'll we'll hear updates, and hopefully it's it's uh, not you know not not a process that drags on forever because it is taking a, a very human toll on and preventing him from spending important time. Uh, with his family and seeing his his young children grow up. Yeah, you know, the message that this sends, I think, you know, being a publisher of a very small outlet, the message that this sends to the powerless is that you are the tar target. Those of us who have, who are engaged with independent media, you know, the New York Times, it's it's been widely reported that New, the New York Times and others um, publish the same content that Julian Assange published, and yet nothing has happened to them. Why is it that the United States is coming after Julian Assange in this way? And, and why is it that um, the Obama administration could see that what they called the New York Times problem, meaning that the New York Times had also published this, so we can't go after Assange, yet Trump, the Trump administration brings it back 
which kind of talks to the political nature of these, these same set of facts. When Obama was president, they decided against um, seeking an ind indictment, but the same set of facts existed when Trump came into power and there they saw it and was successful in getting an indictment. Can you talk about how the same set of facts results in completely different outcomes? And 100%, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. It is scary though when, as you point out, the facts of the Assange case, you open up that indictment, there's nothing new under the Trump administration. He was, uh, he was charged in 2019. And the, the conduct goes back to 2010, 2011. There's nothing new. There's literally nothing that, cha that changed. It was the exact same file, exact same folder that would have gone before a prosecutor's desk. And as you point out, the Obama administration, despite its efforts against the press and against whistleblowers, in fact, at, at that point, uh, President Obama had charged more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than all administrations combined. Actually, uh, Eric Holder, once he left office, had said that his greatest regret of his tenure was uh, approving uh, searches of Associated Press phone records, which was a, a major scandal when it came out. There are a number of uh, there are a number of press freedom violations uh, of searches of journalists of uh, of prosecutions uh, of whistleblowers. So that that was a a, a very a negative part uh, of that presidency. And yet, in 20, uh, uh, 2013, the Obama administration. Uh, told the Post that it declined to pursue charges of Assange for, as you point out, the New York Times problem of the Times, the Guardian, a consortium of outlets had published these same documents. So how could you prosecute Julian Assange and WikiLeaks without also going after those outlets? And that was a problem. It still is a problem. And that's why uh, many of the general counsels uh, of these outlets and, and so many independent media find this case so scary because there is no line once you cross that there's no special there's no special category for journalism or who gets to be a journalist under the first amendment the first amendment belongs to everyone so just because someone has a press pass tag just because someone went to journalism school just because someone runs a, a news outlet doesn't give them some special protection against the Espionage Act or under the First Amendment. Anyone who has a blog, anyone who has a Twitter account is under the same threat as Julian Assange. And that's that's very scary as a, as a potential precedent. So Obama dis declined to prosecute, but the Trump administration revived the thing in large part due to the pushes of Pompeo and the CIA, which he takes credit for in, in his book, um, and the, uh, the numerous agencies within kind of that national, uh, th three letter agency apparatus who, uh, were very upset about publications of WikiLeaks and, and the vault seven, which I, I won't get into, but the, the CIA was furious and it pressured the DOJ and was successful in doing so. But there were attorneys and prosecutors within the DOJ that were not happy and there were high level articles about this, that they were that there were huge arguments and dissenting voices around that room. Some of the prosecutors back from those decisions uh, not to prosecute were, were still around. And they, they were saying, what what are you doing? This is going to set this horrific precedent. And now we're seeing it. Press freedom groups in the U.S. and around the world are going after Biden and saying, what are you doing? Are you going to allow this case to proceed? The, the thing has been honestly, a, a giant headache for the Biden administration. And it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens politically, because even, even the mainstream outlets and the more mainstream kind of center liberal uh, organizations that wouldn't have touched the Julian Assange case before. And I, I mean, I remember upwards of 10 years ago, having the conversations and trying to get some, you know, these orgs onto uh, support letters uh, for him wouldn't wouldn't touch it, but but now they're they're all on it because of the precedent that will be set. I I will raise one more case actually that I think is not as well known but very important 
to uh, keep in mind, and that's the Daniel Hale case. And that's a, also a very sad case. So that that was another one of these um, these instances where you had a decision not to prosecute and it got flipped under the a Trump administration. Now, Daniel Hale was a, a very um, a bright insider. I believe he was um, I believe he was Air Force intelligence, but um, I, I would have to have to check back. But Hale uh, was a alleged source for Jeremy Scale of uh, of The Intercept on exposing human rights uh, drone abuses. So he had exposed how the uh, so-called laser precise drones were in fact actually killing civilians uh, at a widespread basis. And for that, he had been investigated under the Obama administration, but declined to charge him. And under the exact same set of facts, he was charged under the Trump administration and convicted. He wasn't allowed to argue at all uh, he was prohibited from from uh, giving his intent in serving the public interest. He was prohibited from making the argument that I was that that he was uh, liter uh, literally exposing civilians being murdered. He's prohibited from presenting that in court. And now he's actually in isolation and something horrific actually called the Communications Management Unit, which is uh, the Bureau of Prisons uh, euphemism for uh, isolation from everyone, isolation from lawyers as well. So it's uh, uh, such an ordeal even for his lawyers to try to speak to him. So it's it's honestly a torturous environment akin um, to solitary where they they really cut someone out from, from uh, the outside world and, and their support. So it's been really, really sad um, to hear uh, what's happened to Hale. I mean, you... Um, you know, if I Google him right now, one of the photos that comes up is him, uh, an old one of him smiling with his cat. Um, I mean, he's really just uh, this uh, sweet, you know, sweet person who is trying to do something uh, in, in the public interest to to protect lives. And this is where he's at now. Wow. Dick, did, did you want to ask another question, Dick, before we wrap up? Well, I wanted to say that we're Sharon and I are set to go see Ithaca, the movie uh, produced by uh, Julian Assange's brother, Gabriel Shipton, featuring John Shipton and Stella Morris. Uh, we've actually seen a screener of it. It's, it's very, very moving. And it's it's being sponsored by ACLU of Southern California. Uh, we deeply appreciate this this conversation. We, 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 we think people ought to, if they don't already have it, they ought to get on Amazon and, and get themselves a copy. It's it's a wonderful contribution. I guess the question I would have, okay, so what are you working on right now? It's a great a great question, actually. Um I've some I've joked a bit with folks that I'm a little espionage acted out in the sense that we've been working on this project. We're actually supposed to release the thing before the Trump administration. And I, I hate to say he gave us too much extra material to uh you know to 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 not incorporate that. So um so this has been a project for I mean uh six, seven more years actually. But right now actually I've been I've been thinking a lot about uh issues of technology. I think it's a very important uh trend we're seeing about the impact of artificial intelligence on on freedom of speech there's a lot of current debates around that also about the impact of cybercrime laws so there are actually efforts right now to pass a cybercrime convention at the international un level and if you can imagine some of the stuff that went into the computer fraud and abuse act actually a lot of those same principles from that law are, are being pushed uh, onto the international level to standardize them across all countries, which is absolutely scary. And that's just the U.S. I mean, there are other states, including authoritarian states, that are trying to push all sorts of nonsense uh, into this law. So there have been a, a number of human rights groups who are who are involved in that process, and I've been closely watching that. So, so those are the two main things. I think if I had another project, it might uh, be technology-oriented. Thank you. So before we close up, I was just kind of curious. So you've worked on you worked on this book six six or seven years. Do you think that it in any way changed your impression of this country? And did it did it change the way that you teach constitutional law? Um, 
So mo most of the teaching, I, I'd say, is more uh, lectures, but I'd uh, I'd actually be be happy <laughs> for your mentorship on uh, more long term um, positions. Um, but I, um, in terms of my outlook, because I, I have given a lot of talks um, on the act and talk uh, talk to a lot of students, um, not not just law stu students, but also journalism students who are who are often shocked and um, and horrified to hear this stuff. Um, I do think that I maybe had more confidence at the beginning of this pro process and the <laughs> qualifications and competence of policymakers. I, I, I think really what this study has exposed is just how haphazard, politically motivated, and uh, honestly disappointing these processes are that lead to laws being passed and their enforcement and implementation. They're often used to settle political scores at high levels. They're not, decisions are not made with constitutional rights at the forefront, but they're, they're often done around personalities. And, and, and that's very scary especially on the flip side, really diving into the human impact uh, of these cases, because we we dived into these cases and not just into the court documents, but uh, biographies, the writings of folks we interviewed. You know, we interviewed folks who were impacted by these cases, who were at the center of them, their attorneys. We, we really got the, the view uh, from the ground of the personal impact. And it is horrifying, honestly. I mean, for for a country that espouses First Amendment rights to hear hear that kind of stuff happening, to hear, you know, s speak to folks who were around um, at the peak of Vietnam in the Pentagon Papers and who were scared and about to go into hiding because they're getting calls and visits from FBI agents or outlets like the Beacon Press, you know, which was uh, a wonderful left and, uh, and and smaller publishing outlet that had the courage to try to publish the full set of the Pentagon Papers, which is a whole other story I recommend folks uh, look into. But they were their editor was, you know, getting threats by by Nixon and FBI agents. And, and for uh, for an independent media outlet, that's scary. Going back to just what you said before is uh, for, for so many outlets, the, the stuff has such real implications. And, and that's really what we took away is. Uh, we can't we can't forget the human cost. These aren't abstract issues. They ha have a real human cost. Well, Carrie Shankman, I'd really like to thank you and 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 Ralph uh, Engelman for this uh, wonderful job that you've done. Again, I highly recommend the book. And um, we're all uh, waiting on bated breath to find out what happens with Julian Assange. Um, but this is absolutely essential reading, not just for those of us who have studied law. It's essential reading for anyone who, un who wants to understand um, the power that this government has and maybe shouldn't have. Yep. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much, Dick and Sharon. Really appreciate it. So long. Um,